Welcome to the REI Foundation Podcast, where we cover all the steps and strategies to make your real estate dreams a reality. Now your hosts, Jason and Peely. Well, hello again, and welcome to another edition of the Real Estate Investing Foundation podcast with Jason and Peely. Uh, you have Jason today. Peely's out there tackling the world, taking care of the kids, and doing everything other important than the podcast. But you are in good hands because we are super excited to have Josh Cantwell on the program. Josh, how you doing? Good. I'm awesome, Jason. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for coming back on Connecting Again. It's great to see you. A little bit more about Josh. Josh is a Chief Executive Officer of Strategic Real Estate Coach and Freeland Adventures. He's a native of Northeast Ohio, uh, graduated from Baldwin Wallace College in 98, majored in business administration, minor communications, and was a full-time student and athlete. In 2004, Josh took his knowledge of raising capital and the financial markets and started investing full-time in real estate. He was able to combine his knowledge of financial investing with real estate to create a very successful business, which quickly grew. And in turn, he began training and teaching apprentice partners and his students. Founded Strategic Real Estate Coach in 2007 and since then has been involved in, get this, over 700 wholesale, rehab, rental, foreclosure, pre-foreclosure, and short sale transactions, and has taught thousands of investors how to replicate a success. He's got a vast knowledge and experience in helping and coaching clients, mentoring students, apprentice partners from across the U.S. from finding, structuring, negotiating, and closing various types of transactions for profit. So before we jump in here, one other note, those 700 properties he's brought across over 25 states. So it's not just all right here in his backyard. He's had a lot going on. Super excited to have him on the program. So Josh, with, with all that said, 2004 comes, you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into real estate. What was it that clicked? Where, where was it that, that mode that you said, okay, I'm going to go this route today. Was there a moment that you can remember? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I don't, you know, I think it's, I, I would think most people that make that kind of commitment have like the moment, right? I don't know if you have a moment, Jason, you probably do. I have the moment, right? So coming out of college, I was crazy enough to spend like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year to go to college and then graduate from college and take an all commission job as a financial planner, selling financial products and life insurance and 401ks and annuities. And my dad thought I was crazy um, because I spent all this money on a good college education, played college football. And, uh, and then he's like, wait, you're not gonna have a salary? What, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> um, but it was actually probably the best thing I ever did because I learned about sales. I learned about the financial markets. And when I was in my early 20s, I was pounding the phone at much, you know, and talking to a lot of clients, much like we talk to now in real estate, putting deals together, talking to private lenders, talking to motivated sellers. But um, during that process, I noticed that a lot of my clients owned real estate. They didn't have all their money in the financial markets, in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And one of my most successful clients, they all own apartments and rental properties, and commercial buildings with restaurants in them. And I took notice and I remember going through this, um, it was probably a, an eight month or a six month uh, kind of reflection time. And I knew I wanted to make a change. I could either jump into real estate full time. I could either go work for my dad as a financial planner and work more on the, the, uh, the employee benefits side of the financial planning world. Or I could go be a wholesaler for a big mutual fund company. And I remember, Jason, it was in the fall, it was October of 2003, and I was meeting with a local Homevestors franchisee networking meeting, still had my job as a financial planner, got done with the meeting, walked out on Madison Avenue in Lakewood, Ohio, and me and my business partner, we walked out, I said, man, I'm out, I quit. I quit my job as a financial planner, I'm jumping into real estate full time, um, and I, and I was just enamored with, with real estate. At this time, I had done like two deals. Um, I had like two rental properties. And I had about $150,000 a year income as a financial planner. So it was probably the dumbest decision that a lot of people would say, like, this is the dumbest thing you could do. You're 24, 25 years old. You're already making a buck 50 a year. But I was soured on that whole industry. I just didn't like the hours, didn't like how like, constrictive it was. And real estate was so creative. You could be so resourceful. You could put deals together with no money. And I was all in. So it was that moment on Madison Avenue that I quit my job and said, I'm going to jump into real estate full time. I did that. And then 
For the next nine months, we closed no deals. Gotcha. Maybe like two. Um, until we got some coaching and some mentoring and went through some trainings and some seminars, then we finally figured it out. So, but that was the moment. So, so your dad thought you were crazy to jump into an all commissions job. What do you think of you jumping into real estate? Uh, even more crazy, I, you know, but my dad was, Jason, my dad was mostly at fault for this. My dad was an entrepreneur. My dad, uh, you know, grew up in the corporate world and then he decided to go to work as a, a salesperson for an employee benefits company. And then they spun out one of the divisions into a, basically a, a, a employee benefits that just did the life and health side, like life disability insurance for companies. And my dad did that. He's just as crazy as I am. He did that while he was putting my two brothers through college and me through private high school, decided to basically start his venture into entrepreneurship. And so I took notice of that. So I don't think my dad, I think my dad thought I was crazy, but he also kind of saw the writing on the wall because I was essentially following his footsteps. That's awesome. And so you had nine months where maybe you had a few transactions, but nothing really happening until you got coaching. A lot of people jump in, right? And, and it kind of fizzles out because maybe they have that same response. You know, they get in, they're all excited to go. I'm ready to do this. And then hit this roadblock right away. And they can't really get over the hurdle. Do you right. remember what was that, that mental thought or what, what was that process that, that you said, you know what, this is the right move for me. I'm going to continue to push through. I know it's been nine months, not, nothing's been happening. How did you persevere over that time when really nothing was, it was like a stop starter? Yeah. Yeah. Jason, you know, I think for a lot of new entrepreneurs and real estate investors and people that start other businesses, you just kind of know when you're knocking on the door, like, you know, if you're to use an analogy, an NFL team and you're moving the ball down the field, you're moving the ball down the field and you keep kicking field goals and you just can't score a touchdown, but you feel like you're knocking on the door and you're about to score. That's how I felt. Even though I'd gone nine months and it only closed like two deals. I just felt like, we were right there. We were marketing for motivated sellers. We were doing direct mail. We were, you know, uh, we were calling on pre foreclosures. We were getting a pre foreclosure list. We were making offers on REOs, and we were right there. And then I was I remember being at an event. It was on my birthday actually in June two thousand four, and I remember thinking like, "This is this is it, man!" Like, we've got to get into some sort of mentoring because there's just something that's not clicking. One thing, two things. And sure enough, you know, uh, those coaches and mentors that we had gave us a couple small suggestions and sure enough, it worked, the floodgates opened and, uh, and we were really focused on at that time, the Cleveland market, Jason was already in sort of a recession mode. There was a lot of big fortune 500 companies that had left town. There was a lot of pre foreclosures even before the great recession. Um, and so we, we, we started working on pre foreclosures and short sales. And we just went gangbusters with it. And it was that mentoring, a couple, just a couple small suggestions. And you know, Jason, I would tell your audience, sometimes that's all it's about. When I go to an event and I'm involved in masterminds and things, if I can just go and get one nugget, one little thing, it's usually worth the money, right? So that's really my investment is like, can I just get one thing where I can get a return on my investment? And I was, I was fortunate that that happened at that event. I love that. And so fast forward to today, if you were to jump in an elevator and someone said, Hey, hey Josh, what do you do? What, what's your elevator speech about what you're doing with all these things going on? Yeah. So I raise private capital from private investors. I own and run a private equity fund that invests in distressed wholesale real estate. And we also lend on distressed and wholesale real estate. And we pay our investors an amazing double digit return. That is literally my elevator pitch. I love it. That's, and very few people have it under that 30 seconds. So important though, right? And so but, where you are today now, we, we talked before, you know, you doing short sales, doing foreclosures. And now you, you've had this run that a lot of people try to do in their journey, right? And we spoke a little bit offline, but, you know, wholesaling to flipping to cash flowing to commercial. What were some of the key steps for you to, to have this transcending journey? And if someone's starting out mentorship, you spoke about, but is there any other pieces to it that, that they should really focus on when first starting out? Sure. Yeah. Like you, like you alluded to Jason, most investors, when they start, we all get in this business for the cash flow, right? We all want to get massive, passive income, but a lot of investors jump in and say, well, I need to make money today. 
So I've got to sacrifice some of my long-term buy and holds and I've got to flip those now. I've got to wholesale those, I've got to flip those for, for cash. So I did that, you know, leaving a financial planning job that was already paying me 150 a year, I needed current income. So I went through that whole continuum, if you will, from wholesaling to then rehabbing, to raising private money, to owning rentals, to being a private lender, to investing in commercials. I've made that whole continuum, that whole process. One of the things I would definitely do different, Jason, is I would have kept every property I flipped. Looking back, I wish I had kept all 700 wholesale and rehab flips that I've done. I wish I kept them all. Now, the economics at that time maybe didn't allow for that. I needed more money. But looking back, I would have thought, hey man, look, just keep more, that's the end game. I would have focused just on the end game, planted my flag in the ground and said, I'm just gonna focus on building up my portfolio. I'll find other ways, I'll eat ramen noodles, I'll, whatever, I'll sacrifice today for the long term um, in order to just keep every property. Because that's ultimately what we're after, right? Is passive income, net worth, reducing our taxes. And so I just wish I would have kept more of an eye on that at the beginning. So I would definitely encourage your audience to do that, is focus on the long term, focus on the cash flow, not necessarily today's income. Um, the second thing is, you know, it was, when I got started, it was all about the, the reasons, right? The reasons why I wanted to do it. I was making a great income as a financial planner, but it was all about having the personal freedom. Financial planning, I was getting up, I was getting to work at 7.30 in the morning. Sometimes I was getting home at 10 o'clock at night. I was meeting with clients at their house, at their business on the weekends. I wanted to have the personal freedom to do whatever the hell I wanted, whenever the hell I wanted. And I looked at real estate as my, my, my way to do that. I didn't get into this for the money. Money is great. You know, it's, 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 it's more than paid the bills for us. You know, we, we have an amazing portfolio, but I would encourage everyone not to do this for the money. Do it for the personal freedom it provides. The ability to come and go when you want, the ability to go to your kids' events, the, the baptisms, the parties, the soccer games. You know, I'm a coach. I coach a lot of things for my kids, Jason, and I'm baffled by how many dads and even moms miss their kids' events because, of, because they have to work. So do this for the personal freedom. You gotta have really strong reasons. Then the other thing, Jason, is, is the who. It's the people. This is all, this is a business. It's a business, it's all about the people. So I wish going back when I was younger, I paid more attention to who the A players were, who were the, the high performers, because aligning yourself with high performers is how you have a business that has as little headaches as possible, that makes as much money as possible. In the beginning, I hired anybody I could, friends and family. They weren't always the highest performers. And sometimes they caused a lot more headaches than productivity. You know what I mean? So those are some things I definitely do different. So now talking about that, you actually you led into my question there is that, so I, I assume starting out, a lot of people say, I want that freedom. I want that time to do this. But then now they're like, oh, I'm out there flipping a the house and I, I'm doing every part of it. You know, I, I'm out there from, you know, foundation work, framing, you know, carpet, whatever it's taken, I'm out there doing it. Did you start doing the task or did from day one saying, I'm not going to take that route. I'm going to figure out ways that I can get my time back because that's what's important to me. And I'm going to fill these roles. And if it wasn't, when did that start? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and there are really two answers. One is I've built into my life, Jason, what I call non-negotiables. And I did this when I was young. I did this before I was married, before I had kids, when I was single, I had non-negotiables, which meant there were certain things I was gonna build into my calendar that were important to me and my personal lifestyle that I had to build into my calendar that were non-negotiables. Things like going to the gym, things like going out with my friends, playing basketball on certain nights. Um, you know, even before I ever got married, I was coaching sixth grade basketball for, you know, uh, for the local church that I didn't know any of the kids. I just like to coach. It's in my DNA. It's in my blood. So I took these non-negotiables. I put them into my calendar and I said, at the end of the day, these are the things I really want to do. Now I need to work until I'm financially independent. I need to make money. 
So, but these are the things I want to make sure I'm not sacrificing. So I call them non-negotiables. I still have non-negotiables in my life. And those are the things I build into my calendar. The second piece of this, Jason, is self-discipline, right? The key to personal freedom in the long term is self-discipline in the short term, which means that once I had these non-negotiables built into my calendar, then I needed to have amazing habits of self-discipline, meaning I was going to get up at a certain time. I was going to get to work at a certain time. I was going to be consistent. I was going to be accountable. And I would do the same things at the same times. Like I used to go look at properties every Friday. I would look at least 15 or 20 properties and make at least five offers every Friday. That was a non-negotiable. It was a self-discipline that I put into my calendar and I would buy property after property after property after property every Friday. So the idea of personal freedom, when you sign up to be an entrepreneur, when you sign up to be a real estate investor, you don't just get personal freedom on day zero, right? But you can have a certain level of personal freedom by saying, okay, here's the non-negotiables I want to put into my calendar. And those are the things that are important to me. That is the freedom I really want is to do those things. So I'm going to put those into my calendar first. And then I'm going to build my work calendar around it so that I have an like extra time. I can work 40, 60, 80 hours a week, but I'm not sacrificing the non-negotiables. I get both. Then I just go hustle my face off. I'm self-disciplined in the short term so that I can have all that personal freedom in the long term. How do you break bad habits? How do you get back on track if you're in the part of, you want a better life, but the habits are really where you're missing. What's a step to have better habits? Well, I think first of all, it's, it's the mentality, Jason, of basically telling yourself that you are the sum total of your habits. You are what you do every day. So when you tell yourself that and you say, I know that whatever I am, when I add up all my hours this week, I might want to be a successful real estate investor. I might want to be a successful entrepreneur. I might want to have personal freedom. But if my schedule is haphazard, if I'm not owning my time, if I'm not following through on my commitments, then that's really what I am. I am inconsistent. I am not following through. So it's the process, the mentality of telling yourself, I am what I do every day. So if I want to be a successful real estate investor, I have to bake those habits in to make sure that I do that. So first, it's the mentality. The second thing is, it's just got to be calendared, calendared up. I mean, those non-negotiables got to be calendared in. The time when I'm going to go to the gym has got to be calendared in. The time to meet with my team has to be calendared in. And it's got to be consistent. So, like, I have my meetings with my team every Tuesday. And it's been that way for years. It never varies. It never changes. It's the same time, the same day, every week. And we know when we're going to meet. So then that way we don't have a bunch of meetings throughout the week. So it's that, first of all, the mentality. And the second is the calendaring in. And then you just got to follow through. You just got to tell yourself, I am what I do. So if I don't follow through, then I'm, I'm not reliable. I'm not, I'm not consistent. That's who I am. You got to tell yourself, I've got to make a pivot. I've got to be more consistent. And you got to make that commitment to do it. Yeah, I love that. And so now looking at where your business is today, what's, what's in the future? What's in the cards? What are you working to today? Yeah, Jason, you know, we've raised about $25 million of private money. Um, a big chunk of it sits inside of our private equity fund. And then other chunks of it sits in one-off deals, like one-off private lender loans or one-off rehabs or uh, apartments. Um, so we manage about $25 million of our own money and other people's money. And that portfolio is about, it's worth about 93 million bucks. And so we're all about today, just about passive income. So we used to do tons of big rehabs and we've now focused just on buying to keep, buying to hold, buying for cash flow, buying for ROI. Um, and so as we continue to raise more money, it's interesting. The more money we raise, the more people keep coming to us to place more money with us. The more referrals we get because we're consistently producing amazing returns for our investors. And so we're getting a name. So really, you know, when we start to manage that kind of money, you've got to park it in bigger deals. You've got to park it in apartments or mobile home parks. So we're looking for great operators. We're looking for guys that can manage, you know, 50 unit to a thousand unit 
apartment deals, you know, a 25 unit to 100 unit mobile home deals. And we're looking for great operators who need, you know, the money for down payments, the money for rehab, the money for value add. And we're looking to, you know, park money in their deals and then get equity in their deals, get ownership in their deals. So we're looking for great operators because we're really good at raising money. And we've got a lot of people that trust us with their money. We've just got to put that money into deals with really good, with really good operators. What makes a great operator? Yeah, I think, first of all, it's, Jason, the number one thing that any entrepreneur, business owner, real estate investor, operators got to do, if they're taking investor capital, they have to understand that they've got to pay back those investors, their principal plus the promised interest or the promised return, and they've got to protect that capital with everything they've got. That's the number one priority is to make sure my investors get their money back and the interest that they were promised. And I've got to have that sense of commitment from that operator that that's their number one goal that, you know, the investors have to be taken care of first. The investors can get, the investors got to eat steak while the operator eats ramen noodles to make sure that the investors get paid back first and the investors are taken care of. That's number one. And if, you know, I'll invest in somebody who's a newer operator, even if they don't have a ton of experience, because I get the sense that they're going to hustle their face off and they're going to work hard to protect the investor's capital. That's first and foremost. Of course, we look at things like experience, but, you know, I've invested in lots and lots of deals with people that had little or no experience because I just got a sense that they were serious about doing the deal, being professional and protecting the investor's money. That's number one. If I don't get a sense that somebody's gonna protect the money, if they're a cowboy, if you will, with, with their accounting, with their deal flow, if they're a cowboy with people's money, th th there's no way I'm gonna put, put money in with that. I love that. And being across 25 states, what, what, what comes first for you? Is it the market that you're after or is it the opportunity? It's always the operator. It's always the operator. At the end of the day, we're investing in people, right? Um, the deal could make total sense, but I've seen amazingly easy deals get screwed up by a terrible operator or somebody that just didn't have their stuff together. So we invest in people first. We invest in operators first, whether we're lending to them as a private lender and a senior first mortgage holder, mm -hmm. or whether we're bringing in equity to help them with their down payment or you know their, their rehab costs. Um, we... It's, it's all about the operator. And secondly, it's about the deal. The deal, of course, has to make sense. It's got to pro forma out. It's got to have a good cap rate or a good ROI. Um, they got to be in at the right number. That's got to make sense. But it's all about the people. At the end of the day, it's about the who. It's about the who, Jason. It's about who we're investing with, who we're lending money to, who are they partnered with, who are the people that we're lending to. And some people, you know, they're just bad people. Um, and, and, and we want to vet them out, obviously, and, and, and not invest with them. Um, we've made a few mistakes. I'll give you an example of a story that just happened yesterday. Um, we had a woman that we went to in the Cleveland market. She was doing some rehabs. She was highly recommended by another guy. We vetted her out. We had some apprehension, uh, but we decided to fund a couple of her rehabs. And the first two, she bought... They were slow. There were definitely some issues, but she was able to exit those and sell them and pay off our private lender loan. I'm on the third one. Things started getting real squirrely. We ended up having to start foreclosure. She ended up doing a deed in lieu. We took the property back. Talk about bad people. So just yesterday we found out that this woman was representing that she still owned this property and she was marketing the property on Craigslist she met this poor woman who was a single mom and took $2,000 from a, a potential tenant when she didn't even own the property anymore. She's just purposely screwing this person over. Now the police are involved. Um, and so obviously that's an extreme scenario, sure. but that's what it's really all about. Growing a business, real estate, any other kind of business. It's really all about the people. It's all about the who. 
Uh, and you've got to find that creme de la creme people, whether they're operators you're investing with, borrowers you're investing with, partners you're investing with, joint venture partners, your staff. It's all about the who. That's, that's the only way you can grow and scale without too many headaches. That's great. Thank you for that. And right. It's an extreme case, but, but it happens out there. Right. And uh, for you, you, you have to do your due diligence on people and, and just see what you can do your best due diligence. And sometimes people just do things for unforeseen reasons. So yeah, people get desperate. It's, it's tough, Jason. I mean, if yeah. somebody gets desperate, you can turn a really good person into a bad person because they're desperate for money. And we've seen that you know, a few too many times over the last 14 years. Well, yeah, 700, 800 transactions, right? I'm sure you've yeah. seen a lot in your time. Now, for yourself and your personal development, do you have a, a morning routine or a routine that, that helps you get your, your day set or your mind right? Yeah. Um, so I feel for me, it's a great question, and the answer is yes. Um, I learned as, as, as a very young person about Dan Sullivan and the strategic coach. Um, and we learned about free days, focus days, and buffer days. And uh, I, I, I lay my week out in, this, in the same way. So when I have a free day, a free day is a day where we don't do anything that's work-related. Literally nothing. Don't answer emails, phone calls, nothing. A focus day is a day where you do nothing but revenue-producing activities all day. And then a buffer day is kind of in the middle where you're doing work-related things but it's really the stuff that's necessary in business, but not necessarily high revenue producing. It's the things like meetings, um, you know, those kind of things. So I have a variation of that now, and my Mondays and Tuesdays are both buffer days because I'm the CEO of a pretty large organization, got about 40 employees. We do millions of dollars a year in profits and revenues, and we've got several companies. So on Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm simply trying to get all of my team and my staff and my different department heads, making sure they're locked in with their priorities, make sure we're in lockstep with what they're doing and what we're doing for our you know, big company goal, our big company mission. So those are my buffer days. Then Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are all focus days for me, days for me to raise money, uh, days for me to make videos and podcasts to you know talk about our brand like we're doing today um, to get the vision of the company out to get more exposure uh, to either you know get more coaching students because we coach a lot of people or to recruit more borrowers to fund deals with or to recruit more capital to put into deals I do that all on Wednesday Thursday and Friday so my Wednesday Thursday and Friday is just it's it's usually you know, uh, meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting with either borrowers or private lenders or, you know, affiliates and JV partners, Jason, like you, where we can get our message out to the world. So that's a big part of it. When you look at a specific day though, Jason, for me, I've got all my energy in the morning. Uh, I don't know what happened when I turned 40. Like they talk about the 40 year old and your testosterone goes like this. And I think that's pretty true for me. Because in the afternoon, I just seem to have this like weird lull at like between one and three o'clock, where even if I didn't eat a big lunch, you know, I talk about like the two, the, the, yeah, the two sure. p.m. thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't even eat that much, um, but I seem to get like tired at that time of day, and then so I know in the morning is when I do my best thinking, my best strategizing. I get my most focused work done. So I take my kids to school every day, drop them off at seven thirty. I'm at the office by about seven forty-five. And I want my team to leave me alone until about one o'clock so I can work as a total solo by myself doing my thing at about one o'clock kind of come up for air. And usually I'm starting to feel that lull. It's normally when I'll you know, meet with a team member. A lot of times what I like to do at that one o'clock hour is actually go to the gym. So instead of actually letting my, my, my body just kind of fall off the, fall off the edge of the cliff, I'll just go to the gym. That allows me to have a kind of a second burst for the rest of the day. Um, so I do that on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays is, is head to the gym at, at that one o'clock, two o'clock hour. And then I've got a burst of energy for the second half of the day. And normally the second half of the day, I'm usually raising money, talking to one of our current investors or talking to some new prospective investors. And that's a time when I don't have to think much. I'm not strategizing at that time, but I can just freely talk. I can freely mastermind. I can freely network with people. That comes naturally. It gives me energy. So I like to do that in the kind of the third part of the day, if you will. Um, so there's a couple of tips there for, for our audience, you know, on how to break down their week and their day. 
hopefully that's helpful for them. Absolutely is. And, and the through line here is, is focused energy produces results, right? And you've talked about that with, with your habits, with your, with your weekly activities, with your daily activities. And, and it's so true, right? You said you are the sum total of your habits and it's absolute point. If you're sitting there wanting to get into real estate and you look at your week and you've spent, you know, 13 minutes on bigger cop pockets for the week. Well, that's probably not going to be your in route to get into real estate if you're not putting that daily activity into it. So right. I, yeah, I get it. It's, it's right there for you. Do you have a word you live by or, or your company motto? What, it, what is it that, that? Yeah. You yeah. So um, it's interesting. It comes out of, it's, it's two words. The words are be daring and it comes out of uh, my personal experience as a pancreatic cancer survivor. Oh, wow. So in 2011, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, same exact diagnosis as Steve Jobs um, from Apple. And obviously he didn't make it, you know, um, Luciano Pavarotti and Patrick Swayze and a bunch of amazing people have been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And there's just an 8% survival rate with pancreatic cancer. So when I was diagnosed, I was 35 years old. I had a, a two-year-old, a one-year-old, and a newborn. Actually, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a newborn. And I knew it was, you know, uphill battle. Um, I'll never forget, after having this crazy surgery, 10-hour surgery, and the surgeon, Dr. Walsh, saved my life on the operating table. He took out this massive, uh, you know, tumor, this massive cancer I had. Um, took out my gallbladder, my stomach, my spleen, most of my pancreas, a big chunk of my liver. He rebuilt the, um, the arteries and the veins behind my liver. He took veins out of my leg and put them into my, at my abdomen. And I had to relearn how to eat. I lost 50 pounds in three weeks. It was nuts. I had to relearn how to eat at a 35 year old. But I'll never forget the surgery was on November 21st, 2011. On January 3rd, 2012, I went to meet with my oncologist and his name was Dr. Ali and Dr. Ali walked in and uh, he was the one who originally diagnosed me and the one who originally referred me to Dr. Walsh, the surgeon. And Dr. Ali opened up his computer and was looking at the surgery report and I'll never forget Jason, him sitting back in his chair and kind of looking over at me and looking back and his mouth was like wide open. He's like, Josh, I've never seen anything like this before. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, you know, Dr. Walsh, your surgeon, is a daring surgeon. I said, a daring surgeon? What do you mean? It's like, you know, most surgeons would have opened you up, saw how complicated it was, how big this cancer mass was, and they would have said, there's nothing we can do. They would have sewn you up and sent you home and, and said, you know, I'm sorry. Um, and he said, you know, Dr. Walsh is a daring surgeon. He tried things. He did things in this operating situation that most doctors would have never even tried. And I said to Dr. I'll never forget. I said, so you're telling me the only reason I'm alive is because Dr. Walsh was daring. And he said, yeah, absolutely. He said, that's exactly why. Now this whole case study, Jason, to put this into context became it became a case study for the entire Cleveland Clinic surgery team. There were doctors from all over the country, all over the world that studied this surgery um, and what Dr. Walsh did. I'll never forget um, being in the hospital and Dr. Walsh showing me his hands. And I was like, his hands were all black and blue. And I, I remember asking him, I'm laying in my bed recovering, he's at the foot of the bed. And he's showing me his hands. I said, what, 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 what happened to your hands? What's going on? And his hands are like almost as black as my shirt I'm wearing today. And Walsh is like, you know, what, in the middle of the surgery, I had to get my hands inside. So I had to, I, my hands were like inside of your body. And they were banging against the, the clamps on both sides as we opened you up. And they were working in there for 10 hours. Um, and so, you know, our motto for our company is be daring, right? Because nothing significant, nothing substantial is, is really ever gained by staying in your comfort zone. You have to be daring. You have to try something new. 
you have to go out and put yourself out there. You have to, you know, accept the fact that you may fail, but you have to be daring. You have to try. I mean, Dr. Walsh was able to save me um, because he tried. A lot of other surgeons would have never tried. So um, that's our mission is to be daring. We teach our students to be daring. Uh, when we lend to people, we want them to be daring, but within the framework of our underwriting. Not too daring when yeah. we're lending money. Yeah. We want them to you know, do, do good conservative deals. But we know in business, you, you, you've got to have guts. You've got to take chances. You've got to be daring. And that's where that, that's where that comes from. Well, God bless that. And God bless Dr. Walsh for, for taking that chance, right? And, and you're yeah. actually right, is that few people find success and comfort. And for that, Dr. Walsh is, and yourself, right, is a result of that. So God bless that. That's an amazing Yeah. Story. Yeah, you bet. Crazy story, huh? It's, it's incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a big portion for, for a lot of why, as I can see here. So for that, I mean, thank you so much for your time. If, if there's a new real estate investor who, who just turned – found us today and said, I'm going to listen and see what happens. And I want to get started in real estate, but I don't know where to start. What's, what's an actual step someone can take today to get started in real estate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, look, the very first thing that you've got to start with when, when you're getting going with this business is, first of all, you got to tell yourself, right? Don't just dabble in this. Don't just say, I'm going to try it. Real estate is a proven proven way to make long-term wealth, make long-term equity and long-term income. So it's, again, it's all about your mindset. So tell yourself, number one, if anybody else can do this, if Jason and Josh can do this, I can do this. And you can, you can do it. The second thing is, look, there's a big difference between talking about being a real estate investor and I, I want to be a real estate investor and actually doing it. Doing it means that you're actually evaluating deals and making offers. So webinars are great. Podcasts are great. You know, being on different programs, going to boot camps, things are great, but you're not a real real estate investor until you make offers, right? Make offers. So REO properties, HUD homes, you know, apartment buildings, multifamily, whatever it is, wherever you can get deal flow, wholesalers, go get it. But don't just evaluate, 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 evaluate. Make an offer, make lots of offers. Right? You're not a real real estate investor until you've actually jumped in with two feet, which means you've made offers and you're getting counter offers and you're in the game. That's where it starts. I love that. I love that. It reminds me of, so, you know, uh, one of my children's four year old, uh, and he doesn't listen to his mom. So I say, Luke, Luke, you, you need to have your listening ears on and, and you need to listen to what your mom's saying. And he always says, well, I want to listen. And I say, well, the wanting to listen is just the <laughs> actual listening is the step you need to take here. So you can want all you want, but you have to actually do it. And that's right. the part right there that we're trying to get across. Well, Josh, this, this has been awesome. Thanks so much. This has been incredible. For, for the listeners out there, where can they find out more about you, about, about your coaching, about your company? Where, where yeah. Can they find you. Appreciate that, Jason. So, um, you know, you can, you can look us up at joshcantwellcoaching.com. Uh, it's got a lot of information about our different coaching programs, um, an application there if somebody feels compelled to apply. Again, we do it through an application because we want to make sure that uh, people are the right fit. Um, we've got a couple different criteria that we look at, but it's free to apply there. It's free to learn more. Um, and then, you know, our investing uh, private equity fund. You can find that at freelandacceleratedfund.com. Um, that's where we're raising capital and we're deploying that capital into lots of different amazing deals, single family, multifamily, and, and apartment buildings. Um, so there's a, you know, uh, of course on Facebook, those are a couple different places to reach me. Incredible. Well, Josh, thank you so much. This has been an awesome podcast. I've learned a ton. I know everyone out here is really going to benefit from this. So Thank you again. And this is Jason with the Real Estate Investing Foundation podcast. Happy Wednesday. We'll talk to you shortly. Bye now. Thanks for tuning into the REI Foundation podcast. Check back next time for more awesome tips and strategies to launch your new you in real estate.